Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Narain Murthy. I'm a professor at UC Berkeley in bioengineering. It's a pleasure to be here. My lab focuses on drug delivery and molecular imaging. And the topic, the title of my, talk, my, of my talk today is Therapeutic Gene Editing Enabled by New Delivery Vehicles. So Cas9-based therapeutics have the potential to revolutionize the treatment of genetic diseases because of their ability to correct disease-causing DNA mutations and have the potential to treat a variety of genetic diseases such as cystic fibrosis and Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. However, converting Cas9 into a therapeutic requires delivering it into cells, and this is challenging because of its large size. In addition, some Cas9 gene editing applications require performing homology-directed DNA repair, and that even requires delivering a donor DNA. So there's therefore great interest in being able to develop strategies for delivering Cas9 into cells and in vivo. A variety of methods have already been developed to do this. These can be broken down into two broad categories, those based upon viral vectors shown on the left here, and those based upon non-viral vectors. Each one of these has their own pros and cons, which I'll describe on the next slide. Viral-based methods for delivering Cas9 are by far the most efficient ways of transducing Cas9 into cells in cells and in vivo. Of the viral-based methods, AAV is perhaps the most advanced. There's already been a human clinical trial with AAV Cas9 gene editing in the eye. However, using AAV or other viruses to deliver Cas9 can be problematic. And this is because these viruses have really been designed to deliver human genes into people for human gene therapy, where the idea is that you want the human gene to be replaced for a long period of time. That, however, is a problem in the case of gene editing, and this is because gene editing en enzymes are invariably bacterial enzymes and will cause an immune response if they are expressed in people for long periods of time. So the problem with using AAV, for example, for gene editing is that the, the delivered Cas9 will be expressed in cells for at least about four to five years. And this causes two problems. First, because it's a foreign protein, our immune system will recognize that their cells are expressing foreign proteins, and these cells will be targeted for MHC1-mediated DNA damage. In addition, um, having a continued expression of Cas9 can be problematic because of the potential for off-target DNA damage. Uh, Cas9 does have, a, have a, about a 1% to 2% off-target DNA damage rate, and if you express it for long periods of time, such as five years, uh, the, the probability that you, will that you will generate genetic mutations in cells is quite high. So there is therefore great interest in developing non-viral strategies to deliver Cas9. The big rationale for delivering Cas9 non-virally is that gene editing is permanent. Once you have done the genetic modification in a cell, you don't need the Cas9 to be in that cell anymore because the edited cells will have a permanent modification to them. So non-viral delivery is ideal for that because if you deliver Cas9 via plasmid, messenger RNA, or protein, um, all, those, all those modalities will get degraded in cells on the time scale of about 48 hours. And that's enough time for the Cas9 to do its editing and then it's gone. So that, that, that solves two problems. First, it dramatically lowers the probability of an MHC1 mediated immune response. And two, it also dramatically lowers the potential for off target DNA damage. So there's therefore great interest in being able to develop strategies to deliver Cas9 non virally into cells. This is actually quite challenging. And in general, non viral delivery strategies are lower in efficiency than viral delivery strategies. However, there is one exception here, which is the liver. In the liver, uh, Intelia already had a successful clinical trial in the liver where they were able to deliver Cas9 as messenger RNA and get uh, editing in humans uh, with very high efficiency. So this is a, a major landmark. Uh, and, uh, and so in the liver, I think non-viral e editing is, is possible for therapeutic applications. Uh, but outside of the liver, which is where the majority of genetic diseases actually are, uh, it's still an unsolved problem. 
so to address this this problem, our lab developed um, a delivery vector called CRISPR Gold. Uh, this was done in 2017, and CRISPR Gold is a nanoparticle technology that's designed to deliver Cas9 protein, guide RNA, and also donor DNA, and um, correct genes in cells via homology-directed DNA repair. Uh, CRISPR Gold, the rationale for CRISPR Gold is that it's a nanoparticle that has all the components needed to do homology-directed DNA repair, and uh, can, and so that every cell that takes up a CRISPR Gold nanoparticle uh, will then uh, undergo HDR efficiently. Uh, I should mention that this this uh, this work was done in collaboration with multiple laboratories, including uh, Irina Convoy's lab, who's at the UC Berkeley, Jacob Korn, who's now at the ETH in Switzerland, uh, Jennifer Doudna's laboratory, who's at UC Berkeley, and also Kazunori Kataoka's lab, who's at the University of Tokyo. The way CRISPR gold is synthesized is we take a DNA molecule and conjugate it to a gold nanoparticle, and uh, we then take advantage of the fact that the Cas9 RNP has affinity for double-stranded DNA, and we can just take our, our DNA conjugated gold and mix it with the Cas9 RNP. The Cas9 RNP binds the gold, and we can centrifuge that and purify it extensively. We then take that complex and mix it with a, an endosomal disruptive polymer called PSDT, and that is uh, what gives us CRISPR gold. There are a wide variety of genetic diseases that we can potentially treat with CRISPR gold. We selected Duchenne's muscular dystrophy as an initial target, and this is because of the tremendous unmet medical need uh, with regards to treating Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So, Duchenne's is a genetic disease that affects Caucasian males, has a high frequency of about one in 3,500. There's no cure for this disease, and everybody who has this disease dies in their 40s or 30s. Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is caused by a mutation in the dystrophin gene. Dystrophin is shown on this slide here, and it is needed for maintaining muscle health. And the reason you need dystrophin in muscle tissue is because our muscle cells are constantly getting stretched because of, the, of their con contraction cycles. And that stretching uh, imposes a lot of physical damage on them, and dystrophin is basically there to pr protect them from the stretching cycles, the stretching and contraction cycles that muscle tissue undergoes repeatedly. So in, in people who suffer from Duchenne's, they don't make dystrophin, and their muscle tissue starts to die off, and that eventually leads to death. Um, now, now uh, CRISPR-based therapeutics have the potential to treat Duchenne's muscular dystrophy by, by cutting the dystrophin gene at the site of its mutation and correcting it via homology-directed DNA repair. So it has tremendous potential for treating Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So we investigated um, if CRISPR-Gold could rescue mice suffering from Duchenne's muscular dystrophy via the triggering of homology-directed DNA repair. So what we did is we made CRISPR gold that had a Cas9 uh, that was designed to cut the dystrophin mutation and also a donor DNA that was designed to correct it. And this was done in collaboration with Irina Convoy's lab. And in, for these experiments, we used the MDX mouse model. The MDX mouse model is a mouse that has a mutation in the dystrophin gene in exon 21. It's a C to T mutation that generates a stop codon. And so MDX mice do not make dystrophin. So we injected these mice in their muscle tissue with, with CRISPR gold designed to correct this mutation by HDR. And after two weeks, we, uh, we sacrificed these mice and sequenced them to see if we were correcting the dystrophin mutation. The results are shown here. The y-axis is the HDR efficiency measured by deep sequencing. The x-axis is the two groups. What you can see is that if you inject these mice in their muscle tissue with CRISPR gold, uh, we're getting up to about a 5.4 correction efficiency. So 5.4% of the genomic DNA isolated in the muscle tissue near the vicinity of the injection had been corrected back to the wild type sequence, and in the control it was around zero. 5.4 is a fairly high, is a fairly is a reasonable editing rate. Uh, that's that's speculated to be where you would start seeing clinical benefits in the case of Duchenne's. We also analyzed these mice for. Uh, for the expression of dystrophin protein. All the way on the right here is a histology slide of a wild type mouse that has been stained with a dystrophin antibody. You can see that uh, there's a lot of dystrophin, dystrophin staining. All the way on the left is the control MDX mouse. Uh, if you stain it with a dystrophin antibody, there is no staining. As you would expect, they don't make dystrophin. 
However, in the case, in the case of MDX mice treated with CRISPR gold, you can see that there are regions uh, where you have very high dystrophin positivity. And so it can be as high as 60% demonstrating that we are uh, inducing the re-expression of the dystrophin protein. Uh, based on these studies, uh, the lead author of this work, his name was Kun Wu Lee. Uh, he was a graduate student in my lab. He formed a company called GenEdit, which is now focused on developing CRISPR gold and other Cas9 delivery vehicles, and ultimately wants to bring these type of technologies into clinical trials. Uh, what I'll talk about on the next few slides is a collaboration between our lab and GenEdit and another lab uh, at the University of Texas in San, San Antonio, in particular, Professor Hei Young Lee's lab. There are, new, there are numerous organs where gene editing can have therapeutic effects. Of these, the brain is perhaps one of the most interesting. And this is because neurological diseases such as Huntington's and Alzheimer's affect millions of people each year. Their incidence is dramatically increasing because of the aging population. And it turns out that it's actually quite challenging to develop therapeutics for brain diseases. And this is for many reasons, one of them being the blood-brain barrier, and the other one is the toxic effects of globally inhibiting neuronal signaling pathways. We think that gene editing accomplished via a local intracranial injection has tremendous potential for treating brain diseases. And this is because if you do a local intracranial injection, you will overcome the problems with the blood-brain barrier. Uh, you will also just get local editing and that should uh, mitigate some of the toxic side effects of brain therapeutics. And finally, because gene editing is permanent, you'll only have to do this once and doing intracranial injections is already routinely done in a variety of clinical scenarios, such as for treating epilepsy. However, despite its potential, very little is known about brain gene editing. So to learn something about brain gene editing, we started a collaboration with, with GenEdit and Professor Hei Young Lee's lab at the University of Texas in San Antonio. And uh, we shipped them CRISPR gold that was designed to do gene editing in the brain, and they investigated it in a mouse model called the AI9 mouse model. So the AI9 mouse model is shown here. It's composed of a mouse that has the TD tomato gene upstream of a stop codon integrated in every one of its cells. So these mice do not make the TD tomato gene, which is the same thing as the red fluorescent protein, because of the stop codon. However, if you cut out the stop signal by, via CRISPR, you can then get the re-expression of the TD tomato gene, which you can then easily measure via fluorescence. So we made CRISPR gold that was designed to uh, cut out the stop codon and shipped it to Hei Young's lab. She injected it into the striatum and hippocampus, and we made two flavors of CRISPR gold for this experiment, one that had Cas9 and the other one that had the gene editing enzyme CPF1. So the results of this experiment are shown here. What you can see on the top section is the, those are the Cas9 injected mice. Below that is the CPF1 injected mice. So the mice that were injected with Cas9 have a lot of little red dots. Each one of those red dots in the yellow square is a cell that got two cuts and uh, had the re-expression of the TD tomato gene. And so in both cases, uh, Cas9 or CPF1, the amount of red dots is much higher than in the control, which really has uh, no red dots. And we, this demonstrates that we are able to see some editing uh, after an intracranial injection of Cas9 or CPF1 complex to CRISPR gold and that it's actually reasonably efficient. We were able to get a number on this and it's around 10 to 15%. It's worth mentioning that this is a fairly challenging edit to do because you need to make two cuts and then the gene has to recombine. Cas9 is really good at cutting, but it's not particularly good at doing recombination. So we therefore investigated if CRISPR gold could do editing in neurons specifically. And to investigate this, we used um, a mouse model where YFP or the yellow fluorescent protein is only expressed in neurons and we made CRISPR gold that was designed to knock it out by NHEJ. So we made CRISPR gold that was designed to knock out the YFP gene. We shipped it to Hei Young's lab. She injects it into the hippocampus and then counts for YFP negative cells. The results are shown on the slide here. And again, we made two flavors, one that has Cas9 and the other one that has CPF1. The Y axis here is the percent of YFP cells on histology slide. The x-axis is um, the various groups. And what you can see is that in the case of control, uh, control mice, about 30% of the cells are neurons on a histology slide. That dramatically decreases all the way down to about 10% uh, with CRISPR gold. 
that either has Cas9 or CPF1, uh, demonstrating that Cas9 and, or CPF1 complex to CRISPR gold can fairly efficiently knock out genes uh, after an intracranial injection. We're getting knockout rates of around 50%. Based on this, we investigated if we could, um, if we could, if CRISPR gold could generate therapeutic effects in the brain uh, via via intracranial gene editing, and we selected fragile X-related autism as an initial disease target. Uh, we selected this, these, this this disease because of the high unmet medical need. Fragile X-related autism is the most common hereditary form of autism. It's caused by a triplet repeat expansion in the fMR1 gene. That has the effect of knocking out the fMR1 gene. The fMR1 gene is a, is a global inhibitor of protein expression. And it turns out that if you knock it out via this triple, triplet repeat expansion, uh, you get a variety of uh, pathologies in terms of learning and development. It's also known that uh, the mGluR5. It's also known that the mGluR5 signaling pathway also is is uh, is overactivated uh, in patients who suffer from fragile X-related autism. And so we investigated if we could treat fragile X-related autism by knocking out mGluR5 in um, in a a mouse model for fragile X-related autism, which is composed of a fMR1 knockout mouse. So we made CRISPR gold that was designed to knock out the mGluR5 gene, sent it to Hei Young's lab, and she injected it into fMR1 knockout mice or wild type mice, and then looked for the knockdown of mGluR5 via immunohistochemistry on histology slides. So the results are shown here. The y-axis is the number of mGluR5 positive cells, and the x-axis is the various groups. So you can see that in both control, uh, in both wild type and fMR1 knockout mice, uh, the number of mGluR5 positive cells dramatically decreases uh, after treatment with CRISPR gold. So in the case of wild type, in the case of the wild type mice, it goes from 60% down to about 35%. And the, you see similar numbers in the fMR1 knockout mice. So this demonstrates that we can fairly efficiently knock out mGluR5 after an intracranial injection of CRISPR gold. So based on this, we did a, a variety of behavioral studies to see if uh, CRISPR gold could protect mice or rescue mice from the repetitive behaviors that are observed with autism. And it turns out that the fm one knockout mice uh, exhibits many of these obsessive phenotypes. One of them is that they jump up and down obsessively in a cage. And so we investigated if, if and, and, and so not only do they jump up and down obsessively in a cage, it's also known that this phenotype is caused by the striatum. And so we investigated if knocking out mGluR5 in the striatum can rescue mice from this phenotype. The results of this experiment are shown here. The y-axis is the number of jumps in a cage. The x-axis is the various groups. So you can see that fMR1 knockout mice uh, jump up and down much more than the control mice. So fMR1 knockout mice jump up and down about 20 times in this experiment, uh, whereas the control mice, there's almost no jumps. So there's a dramatic increase in the jumping behavior of these mice. And that jumping behavior is decreased uh, more than more than about fourfold by partially knocking out mGluR5 in the striatum. That's the mGluR5 CRISPR uh, uh, bar versus the control bar, the black versus the gray. Uh, there, we also inv investigated some other phenotypes such as line crossing, which have nothing to do, th nothing to do with the striatum. Uh, line crossing is a phenotype that comes from the hippocampus. And in that case, we didn't actually see any effect as we would expect given the fact that our editing is only in the striatum. All right, I'm now going to talk about another uh, Cas9 delivery strategy uh, that's focused on making Cas9 protein conjugates. Everything I've talked about up to now is based upon making, have all been nanoparticle-based delivery vehicles for Cas9. Uh, however, nanoparticles have certain limitations. In particular, they're big. CRISPR gold in particular is around 200 nanometers. Uh, the large size of CRISPR gold means that there'll be a lot of tissues that it will not be able to access. 
We're therefore very interested in being able to make Cas9, um, Cas9 conjugates with polymers or peptides that can do the delivery by, by itself because that should be much, much smaller. However, conjugating things to Cas9 is problematic because if you modify the lysine residues of Cas9, you will almost certainly inactivate it. To get around this problem, we developed a new linker called the DEC linker, uh, which is a disulfide self immolative linker shown on this slide here. The DEC linker is a combination of two linkers shown on the top here where, where it says vector uh, DEC protein. And the DEC linker is composed of two uh, linkers, a thioethyl carbonate linker combined with a 1,6 elimination linker, uh, which, is then modifies, which, which then modifies the lysine residue of your protein. So this allows you to conjugate things to proteins. However, in the presence of glutathione or thiols present in the cell, uh, what ends up happening is the disulfide bond is broken, and that triggers two cascade reactions, two self-immolative reactions, which end up uh, completely releasing the protein without any, any tag or any modification of the lysine residue. The DEC linker has numerous applications for protein delivery. Uh, we've used it for three different applications. I'll talk about two of them today. Uh, the first one that we'll talk about is, is uh, using it to enhance the diffusion of proteins in brain tissue. And this is accomplished by a protein pegylation. So, this, so, so using the DEC linker, we've been able to conjugate PEG to Cas9 and uh, maintain the activity of Cas9 and also improve its diffusion through brain tissue. In addition, we've been able to conjugate self-penetrating peptides to Cas9 and get self-delivering Cas9s that are also enzymatically active. And finally, uh, an application I won't talk about is that we've also been able to conjugate donor DNA to, to Cas9 and can improve the, the, ratio, the rate of HDR uh, using, again, the DEC linker. So, so now I'm going to talk about um, um, using the DEC linker to conjugate PEG to Cas9. So we made a reagent that's composed of PEG conjugated to the DEC linker with a nitrophenyl group on there. And that allows us to stick PEG onto proteins in one step. Uh, there's a lot of interest in being able to conjugate PEG to proteins because it reduces immunogenicity um, and can increase circulation half-lives and can also uh, improve tissue diffusion uh, through mucus and, and also brain tissue. However, if you just conjugate PEG randomly to the lysine residues of a protein, you will almost certainly inactivate it, and hence the rationale for the DEC linker. So the scheme shown here uh, explains how we're doing this. So we have uh, the native Cas9 with all its lysine residues. Cas9 has many lysine residues. We then mix it with the PEG DEC linker, which is called PEG disulfide linker. That sticks the PEG groups randomly all over the Cas9, and that basically generates a Cas9 PEG conjugate that's going to be inactive. However, once the Cas9 goes inside of the cell and there's glutathione, uh, the, the, um, the, the PEG comes off and it comes off completely and there's no residual modification of the lysine residue. So you get back your original Cas9, which should then be enzymatically active. So we started a collaboration with Ross Wilson's laboratory at UC Berkeley and also Chris Benkowitz's lab at uh, the University of, of, of Ohio. And uh, we investigated if conjugating PEG to Cas9 can improve its diffusion through tissue. So we shipped Cas9 PEG uh, conjugated through the DEC linker to the Benkowitz lab, and uh, they injected it into the striatum of mice using uh, a technique called convection enhanced delivery, and this is a procedure where you can inject up to seven microliters into the, into the striatum of a mouse. And then uh, immediately after doing the injection, uh, they sacrificed the mice and looked for the presence of the Cas9 via immunohistochemistry. So they stained with an antibody. The control for this experiment was just an injection of the same amount of Cas9. So you can see on the right hemisphere is what the immunohistochemistry of the mouse looks like after injection with Cas9 uh, DEC PEG. And the left is uh, what it looks like after injection with Cas9. So you can see, and the brown here is where the Cas9 is. So you can see that in the in the in the hemisphere that was injected with Cas9 PEG, uh, there's brown staining all throughout the striatum, and that's suggesting that the Cas9 is really diffusing quite freely through the brain tissue, given that this is a, a specific staining with an antibody. 
And that is in stark contrast to what it looks like uh, after you, um, if you just inject the, the native Cas9. That seems to get stuck in the brain tissue. Not surprising, the, the, the brain tissue is very sticky. So this demonstrates that we can improve the tissue diffusion of Cas9 by conjugating PEG to it uh, via the DEC linker. We've also been able to conjugate cell penetrating peptides to Cas9 um, using the DEC linker. To do this, we made this compound shown here, uh, which, is com which, which we're calling CPP-DEC, and that's composed of the cell penetrating peptide nine, ar arginine 9, so nine arginines, and it's now conjugated to a fluorescent dye so we can easily, um, we can easily track it. And then it also has been, uh, it also has another functional handle on there, which is this nitrophenyl group conjugated to the Arg9 via a disulfide linkage. So the nitrophenyl group here is what actually does the conjugation to the protein. It'll react with the lysine residues on the protein. And then once in the presence of thiols, uh, everything comes off and you get the, uh, the traceless uh, release of the protein. So that's what's shown on the bottom here. The way we do the chemistry is we take the Cas9 uh, which is, which is shown on the left, native Cas9. We mix it with CPP DEC. That randomly conjugates to all the lysine residues on the protein, again, generating what is most likely an inactive protein. But then once it reaches the cytoplasm, all of the CPPs come off because of the disulfide reduction, and you get the unmodified protein, which should be enzymatically active. So we actually investigated if uh, this is actually so. So what we did was we made Cas9 CPP by doing the chemistry I just showed you, uh, where we had about 40 CPPs per Cas9, and then we investigated its activity before and after reduction with glutathione, and this is 5 millimolar glutathione. So the, on the left, you can see the gel uh, where we investigated the enzymatic activity of Cas9 CPP, where it was mixed with a guide RNA, uh, where it was mixed with a donor, where it was mixed with template DNA uh, that was specific for the guide RNA, and on the right of that is um, is the is the quantitation of this gel. So the y-axis is nuclease activity and the x-axis is the various groups. And what you can see here is that Cas9 CPP, so if you have the CPPs conjugated to the Cas9, it is actually almost completely inactive, not surprising given the, that there are a lot of lysine residues on Cas9 that are essential. However, if you now reduce the, the, the CPP off, you can almost get 100% activity back and there's no difference between the Cas9 CPP plus GSH and the wild type Cas9 demonstrating that uh, the linker really is traceless and it's, it's not leaving any tag on there and that we can recover the protein activity. Finally, we did investigate if Cas9 CPP could edit uh, cells. So in this experiment, we took Cas9 CPP uh, that had a guide RNA that targets the GFP gene, and we incubated it with uh, hex cells that express GFP. And, uh, and then after uh, 48 hours, we isolated these cells and uh, sent them for Sanger sequencing. So the results are shown here. The y-axis is the editing efficiency, and the x-axis is the various groups. So the, the green bar is a control where if you just take Cas9 RNP and add it to cells, you only see about 0.3% of editing is determined by Sanger sequencing, again, almost the background levels. And that increases all the way up to 5.1% if you conjugate uh, arginine 9 as a CPP to the Cas9 um, uh, via the DEC linker. So we saw a big enhancement in the amount of editing, uh, more than a tenfold, almost a 20-fold increase in, in editing over the wild type Cas9. And uh, at least in this experiment, this is, compar this is comparable to life effectiveness. So we're now in the process of, of optimizing this and, and finding other uh, ways of improving uh, the delivery efficiency of uh, Cas9 conjugates. So in summary, I've talked about two different uh, methodologies for delivering the Cas9. Uh, the first one uh, was, was a technology called CRISPR-Gold, which was uh, able to do gene editing in muscle tissue and also in the brain. And finally, uh, the second technology I talked about was the DEC linker, which allowed us to make, uh, which allowed us to conjugate uh, peptides and polymers to Cas9 and, and in a reversible manner and also retain the activity of the Cas9. So I want to thank the people that did the work. Um, the, all the CRISPR gold work was done by one very talented graduate student named Kun Wu Lee, who's now the CEO of GenEdit. And uh, the DEC linker was done by uh, a postdoc named Mao Mao He. So finally, thank, thank you for your attention.